morning, everyone. Can I ask you to take your seats, please? So I'm Jim Giambelbo, Dean of the Michael G. Foster School of Business, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our speaker series, Leaders to Legend. Our speaker this morning is Sonny Gupta. He's the founder and CEO of Aptio, a software platform that provides insights into the cost and performance of IT systems. Uh, Sonny has a degree in computer science from the University of South Carolina and years of experience in IT starting as an engineer with IBM. More recently, he was the executive VP of products for Opsware up to its acquisition by HP for over $1.6 billion. In 2012, he was named Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year, and in 2015, he was named CEO of the Year by Executive Excellence Awards. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a warm welcome for Sonny Gupta. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you so much for having me today. Um, super exciting. Um, and I'm, so really what I'm going to do over the next uh, 30, 35 minutes is kind of share my journey around Aptio, how we, how we started the Aptio, the different phases of scale, and uh, different decision points which Aptio kind of had to run through. And then uh, keep it uh, super interactive. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, we'll definitely have a lot of time towards the end. But even as we are going along the way, if uh, there are uh, questions you have, uh, kind of would love to kind of keep it as interactive as possible. So uh, really, I'm going to talk about the, uh, how the concept for Aptio kind of came and, and generally kind of how we have scaled it to what we are today. Um, so just a little bit uh, background about myself. Uh, so I, I immigrated from India back in 1989, came for my uh, undergraduate in computer science. I went to South Carolina. And uh, that's the only university I, I was able to get a scholarship from. And that was my journey there. And uh, finished my undergraduate in three years and also did a, a minor in math. And, um, and really, my journey was uh, starting off as an engineer for IBM. And uh, you know, the, after the first couple of years, I personally realized for myself that, uh, that really sitting behind a cube uh, and, and kind of really writing software code was not really my thing. Even though I enjoyed parts of it, and I really, I really craved uh, customer interaction and the business side of things, but I didn't know quite what to do there. But every, every step I took after that has been kind of really a stepping stone. And, uh, and I think that's generally true with, uh, with a lot of you who, who are in professional careers or who are going to be pursuing professional careers. So after that, uh, I left the uh, software engineer job and kind of went into software consulting for another software company uh, in Boston. And, and that actually uh, gave me deep exposure to the customers. And uh, really interacted with over 50 customers. And that kind of taught me the value of customers. And I, I tell you this background because a lot of the, these concepts will come in handy as we uh, talk about Aptio. And then after that, uh, I, I moved over to, uh, I started my first business in 96. Uh, I was 26 years old. I had nothing to lose. It was the easiest decision for me to leave uh, my job and start a business in Atlanta. We, uh, we were a 20-person company, and we got, we got a call from, um, I, I remember that day, uh, we got a call from, the, uh, from Bill Gates' office at Microsoft, and we had built a technology which was kind of like a plug-in to Microsoft Stack. And long story short, we got acquired by, a, by one of the Microsoft partners called Rational Software in 98. That's kind of what brought me to the Pacific Northwest. We were only 20 uh, people, and I'd made a lot of mistakes in that uh, company when I started. It was, uh, we started the business without any venture capital. And uh, I promised myself, I said, boy, I, I don't know what I don't know, so I need to go learn the profession of software. So uh, Rational, I stayed there for, long t uh, for six years, kind of did business development, and then we were uh, sold to IBM. And then after that, I kind of joined another software company locally with Madrona Ventures. And we sold that business to Mercury, transitioned my career from business development to products. Uh, kind of how do you work with customers to, to get requirements? And how do you create product strategy? How do you create market sizing? How do you create business plans around products? And, and, and I 
I kind of led that function for at, at scale for almost a billion dollar revenue kind of company, right? So kind of saw, saw a lot of different scale uh, points. That kind of got me to my last company before I started Aptio, which was uh, I Conclude. And I started that in 2005. Uh, finally, in 2005, I felt I was ready. I felt like I was ready to be a founder. I was ready to be a CEO. Uh, all the experience which I'd gathered over the last uh, seven, eight years had kind of prepared me. And uh, again, long story short, two years in, we had another company, uh, which is now part of HP, knocking on our door. And we, uh, we were venture funded. Uh, and we ended up selling the business for 70 or 80 million to, uh, to a company in two years. And our revenues were less than a million at that time. And that, uh, after that, uh, in 2007 is uh, when I left HP. And that's kind of when the story of Aptio kind of really starts from a genesis perspective. Um, what I felt before I started Aptio, I felt like there was unfinished business. Uh, my last couple of companies had kind of gotten acquired by bigger companies, and I felt like I needed to do something. Uh, I needed to build a company which uh, lasts longer than myself. And, and, and really, it was less about the space and the category of what, what Aptio is today. It was more around kind of how, how do I build a long-lasting company with an incredible culture. That was really the vision in 2007. I really didn't even know what I was going to do. Uh, but, but I kind of had that kind of vision. So uh, I've been at Aptio for close to eight and a half years, coming up to nine years. So it's probably the longest job I've had and the most fun uh, I'm having. But it feels like the early days. Uh, when I talk to my employees, I talk to our investors, it really, really feels like the early days. I feel like. Uh, I feel like I've been working at this company for less than six months, and that's a, that's a good barrier for me, that am I, am I learning, am I, am I having fun? So let me tell you a little bit about Aptio, uh, because then the story of Aptio and founding and the business strategy would probably make sense. So uh, really what Aptio is today, just three slides on that, and then we'll get right back into how we started the business. So uh, our, our vision around Aptio has been pretty simple. We believe that every function within the enterprise organization has a business management system. So if you think about uh, VPS sales, every organization has a VPS sales, and they use a system called Salesforce. How many people know what Salesforce is? Or, OK. And uh, Workday right, is a HR system. So every VP of HR uses Workday. Uh, Finance people use general ledger systems, corporate budgeting systems. And our vision was very simple to say, OK, all of these functions have, an, have a business system, but the office of the CIO, the IT leader, has nothing equivalent. Uh, the CIO has been putting a business system in place for other functions, but they haven't put anything for themselves. And technology is finally strategic. There's $3.2 billion spent on technology worldwide that you really cannot manage that function on spreadsheets. And we believe it's the next major category, which is, uh, which, which is getting industrialized by replacing spreadsheets and having a true business system to run the business of technology. And that's really what Aptio is today. Uh, we've pioneered a new category called technology business management, uh, TBM. Uh, we, we talk about that a lot. And it, it really is the business system for the office of the CIO and uh, it helps our customers uh, understand transparency into the cost, help them make planning decisions, help them benchmark their costs, and help them just make better data-driven decisions. It's a data and analytics platform. And it works with all the other uh, things which a CIO kind of owns. These things kind of look simple today, but uh, it was not really that simple to us when, we, uh, when I started Aptio. And I'll kind of tell you about the journey of how we kind of got there. So uh, you know what's uh, impressive about Aptio 2 is today uh, we have uh, close to 650 plus employees. We have fair amount of scale from a revenue perspective. And we have uh, 300 customers. But really, 40% uh, of the Fortune 100 customers run their business of technology on Aptio, whether it's customers like Microsoft or Coca-Cola or Nike or Goldman Sachs or Bank of America or JP Morgan Chase, right? We have a pretty broad set of customers in different verticals uh, with presence in North America, Asia, and, uh, and Europe. 
So that's a little bit about Aptio. So let's go back to uh, how I think about the scale points of any kind of business, right? So uh, this was a chart which was put up by McKinsey. Uh, pretty simple, right? So the first part is what I call the concept stage. That's kind of really what, when you're achieving the product market fit. In a technology company, product market fit is everything. Uh, what, what that really means is, are you able to build a product? Are you able to validate a product which customers are willing to pay money for and they can deploy and get value from? And uh, ultimately, uh, the business of a software company is selling products, right? You, you build products and you sell products. Those are the two most important functions within, within a technology business. And uh, What's fascinating is 90% uh, of the companies kind of fail in that stage of just achieving the product market fit. And then uh, around, then I, I kind of have this thing called Act One, which is really achieving scale in the business. And that's, uh, I kind of categorize that as kind of $100 million revenue scale, right? And that's, uh, that part is pretty hard. So 28% of the survivors reach 100 million. So 2.8% of all technology companies kind of get to that phase. And then you have uh, Act 2, which that's kind of the stage where Aptio is today. And I'll kind of talk about the journey of each one of the steps. Uh, we think about kind of how once the company has gotten critical mass, how do you go from 100 million to a billion? We are very early into that journey, and that's the Act 2. And Act 3 is uh, uh, only 3% of the companies reach that, which is uh, how do you get past the billion dollar scale point. So this is where Aptio is. Uh, generally, uh, my hard learnings over the years has been that uh, the odds are generally against you uh, when you're really starting a new business. And especially, uh, I personally believe once you get the product market fit and when you get through Act, act 1 or, or kind of reasonable uh, execution in Act 1, the next acts are slightly easy, uh, but the first pieces of product market fit are super, super challenging. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the genesis of Aptio. How did Aptio achieve the product market fit? So this is back in the summer of 2007. Um, I'm selling my previous company to HP, and I'm sitting with one of our largest customers, Goldman Sachs, in New York. And literally five minutes left into the meeting, I'm kind of telling them how HP will take really good care of uh, the technology. And, uh, and I was personally going to take some time off and just think about what I'm going to do next. And a uh, few minutes left into the meeting, and uh, I asked a pretty simple question from the customer. He was a CIO for Goldman Sachs, so pretty senior exec. I said, what are you struggling with? And, and really, it was that. And... Uh, and that five minutes really turned into 45 minutes. And uh, he started describing to me, just randomly, he started descri describing to me this concept of what Aptio is around what technology business management is. He certainly used different words. It was pretty high-level conversation that, boy, I'm really struggling with. We, we spend billions of dollars on te technology. There's no way to me measure the ROI. There's no way to measure the business value. There's no way to do cost accounting on, on technology. And I, I didn't really come from a finance background, so I, I, I didn't think much of the conversation at that, that time. On a long flight home, I started thinking about the idea, and I, I was like, boy, this is, uh, this is so obvious. Why hasn't it been done? Why, ha why, has, why hasn't anybody done it? And that, that really kind of had a, that conversation really had an impact on, on kind of me. And then kind of what I did is over the summer, um, I, I, my early uh, learning had taught me one customer can give you a concept like Goldman Sachs and, and one, of the, one of the traps for technology companies is you build a, a product for one company. And especially Goldman Sachs, which is a very, very large uh, technology shop, their needs will be very different than University of Washington or a smaller company in a different vertical. So what, what I did over the summer of 2007 is uh, really took my time and, and spent time with 40 customers 
different verticals, different geographies, a lot of relationships I had, just kind of flushing out the idea and just really asking them, uh, is this something that they resonated with? And that was really, really important to me. Uh, I, I think the, uh, too many technology companies get started with uh, technology founders. I'm a technology founder without uh, technology looking for a market as opposed to a market which exists, which is deeply customer validated. And, uh, and, and, and that work which we did in uh, summer of 2007 still comes in handy to kind of what Aptio is today. Now our business model has changed drastically, but a few things which were really, really important to us in that journey, um, number one, visual prototypes. So we created a visual mock-up because uh, what I realized is when you're having a conversation with the customer, it's, it tends to be pretty theoretical, but if you can put it in pictures, if they can see how they would interact with the system, you start to get kind of real feedback. So that was super important with, for us. Uh, number two, uh, we spent a lot of time on was product differentiation. Why, uh, why hasn't this been done before? How is this going to be different than what you own today? Uh, how is it different than the other financial systems? So really thinking about your differentiation, market differentiation, because my worry was it's a new category. And frankly, everybody told me that do not start a new category. Starting a new category is super hard. Why don't you, why don't you take an existing system and do it better and cheaper? And, uh, but that quite didn't excite me. I, I wanted to do something which hadn't been done before. So the differentiation became super important up front before we wrote a single line of code, like how are we going to position this? How is this going to be different than what a CIO owns for them to be able to spend money on? The third key question, the most important question out of all this, are you willing to pay money for this technology? And I went to the lengths to actually have customers write me a one pager uh, MOU to say if I build this technology, that was really, really important because uh, what I've learned over the years is uh, a lot of people want to give you free advice. Uh, like, yeah, this, this would be interesting, this would be interesting. But uh, the key question in my mind was, are they personally willing to part with money from their enterprise organizations and do they value this technology so much? And so we had three to five customers who kind of gave us that validation and that allowed me to form a very early advisory board which I used to kind of drive product feature function differentiation. Okay, so the second, uh, we're still in the concept stage, right? Uh, so it's me at this stage, I have um, uh, four to five in other individuals who I had worked with in the past. So I'm starting to talk to them a little bit about the concept. And uh, building the right level of team, super important in startups. Uh, these partnerships are uh, deeper than uh, a marriage. Uh, and seriously, I've, I've been married for probably 16, 17 years now. And uh, the, 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 the amount of time which I have spent with my co-founders, the amount of challenges we've kind of gone through, the journey which we've gone through, you better make sure you have the right set of people uh, surrounding you. And, and these are people you genuinely have to be able to work right through good times and bad times. And, uh, and, and few things which were really important, complementary team, were the skill sets complementary? So I had a technology co-founder who could write the software code. I had a CFO who was kind of complementary on the business side. And then there were a couple other uh, individuals on the software engineering side. But really, uh, I was really thinking very systematically down what am I good at, what am I not good at, and let me surround myself with the, uh, with the people. I also wanted people who would challenge me. Who, who would question every decision in the early days and, uh, and who had that kind of spine. That was really, really important because we kind of kept, kept each other in check. Uh, and then certainly common culture. I'll talk a lot more about the culture. Uh, culture, uh, in my opinion, trumps strategy. Uh, any any, any, any kind of strategy, uh, I would take culture over strategy. Do we, do we think about the world the same way? Uh, one of the things which was really important to me was that, hey, is this founding team, do they want to, do they have a vision to build a company uh, for the next 20 years? Or are they looking for a quick sale, right? Are they looking to build a company to just kind of get acquired? And, uh, and I just didn't want that mindset. I wanted a pretty long-term kind of thinking culture uh, between the team. So those were the things which we kind of focused on. 
And then uh, why raise capital, right? Uh, so capital was really important for us to raise. Uh, I had, uh, in my previous companies, I'd raised capital from uh, venture capitalist firms like Madrona or down in the valley, uh, Greylock, which is on uh, board of Facebook and EMC, VMware, those type of companies. And, and a lot of people ask me, like, why raise money first of all? Uh, my perspective at that time was that in technology businesses, what I learned was that either you go big or you go home. If you're, just, if you're just kind of walking around and taking five years to achieve product market fit, uh, technology businesses change at a pretty radical pace. Uh, every technology company gets disrupted and they have to disrupt themselves at some stage or the other, right? You can see that movie written for Microsoft, you can see that for Apple, you can see that for Cisco, you can see any large technology company and kind of it, the disruption kind of happens. And we, I was worried that, hey, we have to go super fast. We have to establish the category. We have to acquire customers. We have to build an incredible product. We have to make our customers successful. And how do I go faster than anybody else has gone? And uh, so we, I could have certainly self-funded the business, or I could have gone big and kind of raised big rounds, right? And, uh, and then uh, the second uh, thing with the founders kind of all got together, they were like, boy, we shouldn't raise the money because we're going to take the dilution, and dilution is not necessarily a good thing. But I fundamentally believed in a big pie theory. You raise capital, pie just becomes bigger because your, your value is more you and, and uh, uh, you know, 100% of, of zero is, is nothing, right? But uh, but ten percent of uh, a billion dollar company are that. So so we were we were really really focused on going big or going home. the big pie theory. The dilution didn't really uh, daunt us as much in the early days. And then uh, we had a decision to make: should we do seed funding? Should we do venture? In our case, we ended up doing venture. So we we ended up raising seven million in our first round. We we actually just had a PowerPoint at that time. And uh, we didn't have any working code. We had customer validation. And so we, we just wanted to go fast. But uh, the promise I made the investors is we're going to keep the burn super low. We're going to spend less than a million bucks. But I'm going to get to your product, and I'm going to get to you seven to 10 paying customers uh, with a million dollar burn. But I wanted to have the additional capital at our disposal. Over the years, um, I had a bet with the venture capitalists at that time. They thought uh, I would need 40 million to build a successful software company at my pace. And I told them 20, uh, but we both were wrong. So uh, over the years, Aptio has raised 136 million of capital. And, uh, and sometimes I wish I would have raised another 100. <laughs> so uh, these technology businesses, if, especially if you want to go fast, uh, right? It, you just, you, you need capital. So uh, what do investors look for? Really, uh, you know, people talk about kind of multiple concepts. I, I can only kind of speak to my experience. Uh, so it's the market, market opportunity, how big is the idea, you know, what is, uh, we, we use a word called TAM, which is uh, total addressable market, like how large is the market, software and services, what is the differentiation, what is the competitive barriers to entry. Uh, how fast can you scale the business? Those are all kind of the elements around the market. Who's the buyer? Uh, and then really the second piece is the team, which I've kind of spoken about. And the third is kind of, hey, which is tied to the team. Can this team really execute? What is their ability to execute? And what it really, in my uh, case, I had, uh, the only thing I had was a PowerPoint, right? And, and we had a team and a PowerPoint. And we had a bunch of customers. And really, uh, the, I'm really grateful for the fact that the venture, the venture industry sort of trusted us, but it all, it was less about the idea. It was, it was more about the team. They really felt like, hey, this team can execute. And what I've learned over the years is that a, a great team will take a bad idea and make that bad idea into a great business. And, uh, and by the way, the flip side of that is true as well. A bad team can take a really good idea and, and run that company into the ground. So, so our, uh, 
you know, our value proposition to the investors was that, hey, look, we, we have a good team. We're going to learn. We're going to listen. And I'll talk a little bit about the characteristics of that. And then, uh, and then uh, we, will, we, don't, we don't have all the answers. We really didn't. We really didn't know what the objections were going to be with the customers, right? And are we going to be able to build the right technology? But we had conviction that, hey, this team can achieve pretty much anything. And we really believed that way. We really believed that we could do anything. And, uh, and that was really probably the bet which the investors were really making. And over, over the years, that bet certainly came true for them and for us. So let's, uh, I'm going to pause after this slide uh, before we go into the next act. But uh, let me talk about some of the key strategic decisions which we had to make in the early days uh, and kind of how that business model has morphed for Aptio. So uh, when I first wrote the business plan, we, we had a theory that we are going to sell Aptio to small customers and uh, kind of like Salesforce. We're going to sell to thousands of small customers around a $1,000, $2,000, $5,000 price point. And I wanted very large volumes of customers, right? And we had a deliberate strategy, small customers versus large customers. Uh, the interesting part is, over the years, Aptio is today selling to large customers. We st my first five customers were small customers. Our first customer paid us $1,000 a month. Uh, and then three years later, uh, a large customer paid us close to uh, $4 million a uh, year, right? So in three, three years, we kind of totally changed our market because we had a theory, but when we started going to market, we found that the large customers were really resonating, uh, and small customers were as well, but we had to make a decision. Where do we optimize our resources? Because it's... Where do we market? Where do we have our sales motion? How do we build the product? Do we build for the large customers or the small customers? The requirements were different. And, and along the way, we make, made the bet to go after the large customers. And that bet turned out to be a good bet today. Sell to the CIO versus sell. Uh, CIO is a C-level person within the organization, very hard to get to. Everybody practically told us, go sell to a director level individual because they're easier to get access to. They're easier to get on the phone, right? When, when people don't know you. We made the decision to go after the CIO uh, and that bet also kind of turned out to be good. Now that was not our early bet. We, we were going after the director level but along the way we learned and morphed. Uh, displacing existing category versus pioneering new category, I've kind of spoken about that a little bit. Uh, we had a lot of debate. Should we display some, something and do it faster, cheaper, or should we do it as a brand new category? On-premise versus the cloud model. This was a really interesting one. This is found in 2007, right? Cloud is still in the early days, and uh, all my customers, all the prospects who I was talking to, they told me that I will not buy the software if you put it in the, in the cloud, because I will not part with financial data. And, uh, and that was a big uh, probably contention amongst the founder, founding team and our investors. And uh, I really, uh, you know, we talked to a lot of customers. We, we talked to a lot of security experts, and they said, okay, if you do A, B, C, D, these are the reasons why we would, uh, you could convince us to buy in the cloud model. And, uh, and, and we made that bet. By the way, out of all these decisions, the number fourth was the one which was probably the bet I was the most nervous about. Because once you decide to put your software in the cloud versus kind of on-premise, it's really, really hard to kind of change your business model. Now, companies like Concur with Steve Singh and so forth have kind of done that in the past. But, uh, but I just, that was, the, that was the bet. I was like, what if people don't buy the software? And then disruptive technologies, like should we build our own stack? Should we license third party? Uh, you know, we, we uh, this is a lot of technology jargon I'm, I'll, I'll use in the next 30 seconds, but we ended up using, we didn't use relational databases, we used in-memory kind of columnar stored databases. We built our own database when uh, these technologies were very early into that market because we felt like that, that'll give us a disruptive kind of technology advantage, and we had a lot of debate over uh, those uh, issues as well. But that's kind of really uh, were some of the strategic decisions which Aptio kind of had to go through. We also had some early strategic decisions 
that hey do you go to Europe how when do you go to Europe and we were pretty disciplined we really wanted to kind of see our ROI on our existing investments and 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 we had gates in how we kind of expanded our investment footprint let me just pause here before I go to uh, the next two acts of uh, kind of scaling and business decisions to see does the founding story of Aptio make sense or kind of what questions or comments you may have related to Aptio's journey. Can you tell us a little bit about your uh, advisory board and what they added to your thinking in the early days of the company? Yeah, Jim. So uh, our advisory board, uh, super, super strategic. They, uh, so first of all, these were prospects. They, they hadn't bought a software, but they, they were really passionate about our software space. And there was no financial commitment between them and us. Uh, they were doing it because they really wanted to see innovation. They were super passionate. They were early adopters of our concept. And really, uh, what I found is that when you talk to a customer one-on-one, -on -one, they may give you kind of very individualistic feedback around their IT environment, and that was really important to us. But it was as important for us to have a group think on, on kind of our category, our product feature set. So we formalized this advisory board. We had around 10 to 12 people in the V1 uh, version of this advisory board. We flew all of them up to Seattle. We spent half a day around product differentiation, product features, and they also gave us access to their own IT environments to help us validate the technology within their own environments. And that, and by the way, our first four customers, paying customers, came out of that advisory group. So that, that turned out to be good. And that, that notion exists in Aptio pretty deeply today, where we continue to kind of work deeply with customers. Obviously, the advisory board has kind of morphed uh, pretty significantly. But I would say without that, we wouldn't be here, just because they gave us, uh, we, we had our own theories of kind of what this software should do. But, uh, but, but they were the real ones. They were the customers. They kind of gave us a unique perspective on, on what would make it different, what would make it faster deployment, faster adoption, those type of things. Even pricing, things like the pricing model was uh, quite instrumental from, from that group. Yeah, that's a really good question. So the first, uh, first five or ten uh, were all through networks and introductions through uh, maybe through some venture capitalists or some of my early relationships. And, uh, and, and the first early customers kind of come usually that way. And, uh, but after that, like every company has to really figure out how to do that at scale. And so we, uh, you know, Probably unfortunately for the market, but fortunately for us, uh, the market was going through a downturn in 2008, 2009, if you remember, right? Wall Street is crashing. And so one of the things we did at that time was, uh, because we are an analytics and a data-oriented system, we, in order to get the attention of a CIO, we pivoted our messaging to cost-cutting. We said that, hey, these are tough times. You don't have transparency in your technology spend. And, and we can be your aspirin, right? We can help you identify where to cost cut. Now, we were testing this messaging out. And what started to happen is three to four CIOs started returning our phone calls. And uh, these were people we didn't have relationships with. And so that started to kind of prove it to us that, boy, we can do it. And then once we got a, a CIO engaged, we made them successful. We, we allowed them to kind of be a spokesperson for uh, Aptio. So that was sort of like it was stepping stone, one customer or one CIO at a time. We still have challenges, right, trying to get to CIOs. Uh, uh, but but it, it's certainly the first 50 customers were the hardest ones, and the, the last 100 have been easier from that perspective. Uh, so uh, the concept validation uh, phase took around probably four months. So where we were, uh, but we didn't have any code. We had the visual prototypes, and we had done 40-plus customer interviews because a lot of these customer interviews, we had to keep going back to them uh, with the visual mock-ups and saying, okay, does this work? Does this not work? So probably it took three to four months over the summer 
And then uh, in November is kind of when we, uh, November 2007 is when we founded Aptio. And, uh, and really in, by, at that time we didn't have any working code. We just have, had visual pro prototypes. The version one of our software, which customers were paying us money for, was in uh, June of 2008. So we went super fast, eight months. Actually, that's a good story as well because um, there was a lot of debate uh, whether I should take two years to write the first version of the software. And uh, what I've realized is engineers, if you, give them, if you give them two years, they'll take two years. And, uh, and, I, will, and I speak that from experience because I was an engineer myself. And uh, so, uh, so we, we had a decision to make. We said, hey, I'd rather cut on features and functionality, but I'd rather get to market faster because that's where all the risk in the company tends to be. It's, it's that 90% companies why they don't succeed. And so we were really focused on the version one of the software and do it in nine months, even though it won't do all the things, but let's start getting money from customers, engaging with them, and help them evolve our feature set along the way. What set, excuse me, what set did you take to sort of bet the feature at the top at that point? It's also big. Yeah, uh, that, that was probably the toughest uh, thing. And, and frankly, I, I didn't quite, uh, no, still, when we made the decision. Uh, I made the decision based on what was happening in the market with uh, early days for Amazon, what was happening with uh, Salesforce.com uh, and other cloud companies, and then uh, we did a lot of interviews with security experts within some of these large enterprises. So, in fact, I flew six of them up to Seattle, and we spent half a day, and, and we started just going through, like, hey, what do you, like, so you're telling me all the reasons why you wouldn't buy it. Uh, tell me the reasons, what would I need to do in my software for you to be able to buy the software? So once I switched that conversation and we started going into the granularity, we started to probably get more requirements around security. They said, okay, if your software was this, 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 it had encryption, it had uh, fobs, like we would probably trust the software. And so those are some of the early decisions we made. But to be honest with you, I, I, I just didn't know at that time. Uh, I, I, this was, that was my, that was the area where I was the most nervous about. And in fact, secretly to my co-founder, I'd said, look, it could be the case that one year, two years in, uh, we may need to switch our model to on-premise. It's going to be an, it's going to be awful for us to do that, but uh, we should be re prepared for that. Let me, let me take you to the next uh, few steps of the journey. So, uh, so now we are act one, which is, we have the product market fit. We have the first 20 customers, paying customers, right? We know who we are selling to. So how did Aptio kind of go from that concept to scale, which is $100 million revenue plus company? Uh, and, and this, by the way, phase happened for us fairly fast, I would say. Uh, in fact, at one time, we were the fastest to 50 in enterprise software, fastest revenue scale to 50 million in revenue. What some of the things which we did so firstly, we were going after early adopters, uh, anybody who would talk to us, uh, right, anybody who listened to us, and, and, and we had a lot of discussions around, okay, that approach is not going to work. We got to have a target market. We got to have our beachhead, right? Where are we going to get the first 100, 200 customers? And that's, we said, okay, we're going to go after the top end part of the market, not the, not the global 10,000. We're going to go after Fortune 1,000 customers who have large IT budgets because we had very good validation that they had the biggest pain point. So that was a big decision. Number two, we had a platform motion. Initially, we were going to customers and saying, okay, what problems do you have? And we can solve those problems. But we started to really narrow our focus down to say, okay, you know, you're really looking to understand your cost, transparency, do better planning, but we, we took our platform with highly customizable kind of resources to ha start deploying this in customers one at a time. Uh, prospect advisory board, uh, that was uh, kind of what I've spoken about. From there, we went to uh, establishing a nonprofit council of CIOs because a lot of the prospects started to say that, hey, I'm not willing to speak on your behalf on Aptio because I, I don't want to be viewed as endorsing Aptio but this is a very strategic category. So what if you spun it out into a nonprofit uh, and it becomes an industry organization to help technology leaders run IT like a business? 
So, we formed that. That is by the way up to 2200 uh, leaders today, 200 plus CIOs. Founding team, uh, that was the other big learning I had. We had to go from a founding team to an experienced executive team. Uh, and and th this was a really tough transition for me personally because you realize the people who start the business with you, they are really good at the first 20, 30, 40 customers. But uh, this team uh, could not get me to uh, 100 million of scale and I needed to bring in experience from the outside. And frankly, if I didn't do that, uh, my board would uh, look for a CEO, right, who, who had that experience themselves. So, so we had to morph through the team. What, what I'm really proud of that team transition was that a lot of our, all our founders, except for one now, it's been probably nine years, right, everybody is still in the business. So even if people's roles have changed over the years, but, uh, but they've kind of stayed in the business. So there's definitely a playbook of how you kind of, how do you bring in kind of uh, more senior talent. But without the team morphing, uh, we wouldn't be here. And then capital, right? We continued to raise kind of capital. The following rounds of capital were easy just because we had more business metrics to show. We had scale, we had customers. The first one, they were betting on the team primarily. The, the later rounds, they were looking at like how much revenue do we have, how much scale do we have, how much traction, what is our competitive market positioning and so forth. This is the phase we are in today. Aptio is a company. So we, uh, this phase for us kind of started almost two years ago. And, uh, and we are very early in this journey. Uh, but we, are, we have gone through a pretty massive uh, transformation in the business in the last couple of years. And the big pivot points for us have been, so, so what made us successful in the act one was global thousand customers. But we started to realize that we're going to run out of the large customers. And the large customers take nine months, 12 months, 24 months to buy. And we have to have a faster velocity, faster acquisition, customer acquisition model. And we have to sell to much broader set of customers. So we, uh, we said, like, let's go sell to global 10,000 customers, not just thousand, uh, Fortune 1,000 customers. Pretty big pivot point because the way you think about products, the way you think about marketing, I have to do everything at scale. Uh, executive team has morphed. I had to bring the next version. It was really interesting. We were hiring, bringing an exec team for Act 1, and then we realized that Act 1 executive team, only two people scaled to the next phase. So, so we bought uh, three different kind of positions from the outside, and one person didn't work out. I, I, I personally believe uh, one out of three execs which you hire is not going to work out, right? So you have to be prepared for that as well, uh, which is, I know it's kind of shocking, but uh, that's been kind of certainly my learning. I've talked to a lot of my peer CEOs and they kind of feel the same way. Just because you always end up making uh, hiring and the best, best day for people tends to be when they interview with you, right? And then uh, nine month deployments to three month deployments, how do we, rather than selling a platform, how do we sell kind of package applications, and then, uh, and then rather than, uh, w the difference on the capital strategy for us is we were very focused on just growth at all costs, burn money, but grow, grow, grow. As we are starting to get into act two, uh, the principles of the business have shifted to say, yes, we have to continue growing, but we have to become cash flow pro positive. We have to start generating cash. and. Uh, and that's, that's a pretty, we're still going through it now, uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a hard culture shift to make when, you know, the plane is kind of going at 600 miles an hour, right? Uh, and, and, and you have to kind of start shifting the culture, the language, and, uh, and we are doing pretty good against those goals. So those are our uh, kind of few areas of act uh, two. Now, we definitely have a vision which takes Aptio beyond to a billion dollars where one of the things we are finding is what we do for IT, we can do for other functions. People want to cost out a onboarding of an employee, costing out a legal service, costing a facilities building. So we are really realizing we are a platform. We have a very powerful analytics platform we can apply to other functions. But uh, it's a resistance in the organization today where we tell our organization not to focus on Act 3 because, because really uh, we have to focus on Act 2 and be successful. But this is something which we uh, think about a lot and think about how can we validate these concepts today. So two to three years from now, 
like it'll position us for uh, for the growth. And then, uh, you know, there are many decision points we have to make. Do we do it now? Do we going to employ the same sales strategy, or are we going to employ a different sales method? We're going to sell platform. We're going to sell apps. These are all the strategic decision points we have to validate over the next three, two to three years uh, for Act Three, right? Our growth uh, uh, strategy and vectors, kind of how we think about selling primarily to new customers. Then, kind of now we are starting to get an install base. How do we sell more value to an existing customer? And then, thirdly, how do we expand our market opportunity? But overall, we think about this as a six billion dollar plus addressable market opportunity today. By the way, when we started Aptio, uh, that market opportunity was close to half a billion. So as we've kind of gone, we've morphed. Our addressable market has kind of, because we, we just know more, right? We know the pricing behavior. We, we, we can just kind of do better planning. The point in saying that is that it's very hard to kind of have a business plan day one, right? And, and it's going to morph. Culture, super strategic. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll kind of go past it. But, you know, we, the founders kind of really thought deeply about the culture, like as important it was for us to build a great company. We wanted to have a great culture. And we really have institutionalized the culture in many different ways. Uh, and then lastly, uh, just lessons learned, right? I'll end with this. Uh, these are all the things I can probably summarize. Uh, probably the most important would be ability to listen and morph. Uh, you may have certain concepts in mind around the business, and that's going to that's gonna morph, that's going to change. And we continue to validate that even today. Uh, unwavering commitment to the customer, super really important. Like if you just listen to customers and just are, are really focused on their customer success and, and that be the North Pole of the organization, that usually will lead to success. And it's, it's really, really hard a lot of times because because the customer may, may be telling you something drastically different than what you think the kind of business you want to build. And, and that's kind of when this theory kind of really gets tested. Evolution of the team, uh, you know, as kind of I shared my journey, we've kind of gone through two different or three different morphs of the journey. And that will continue to happen in our business as, as we kind of evolve. Uh, fast failures, I think this is the other thing I learned uh, a lot, like how do you fail fast uh, and admit those failures uh, with your teams, with your employees, even with your customers, but, but fail fast. You want to have a culture of experimentation uh, and, and you want to make sure people, people feel okay about failing, right? And then, uh, and then a lot of people ask me, like, was it one big decision which got up to you to this point? And I wish the answer to that was yes. Uh, that would be easy. But it was, it, was a series, it was a series of hundreds of different decisions, right? It's continuous iteration on these decisions, perfecting your execution, validating your assumptions. And, and, and some of those small decisions, at that time, it felt like small decisions. I look back now, and I'm like, boy, those, those were some pretty big decisions. Um, and then just continuing learning from others. I mean, this is an incredible community. Uh, there are just a lot of great leaders. Uh, there have been a lot of great mentors in, in kind of my life, including folks like Steve Singh and so forth. And just continuing learning, how do we learn from others, others' experiences and kind of take that and kind of form your own personal philosophy around, around building a software company. And uh, certainly, we are, uh, we've made a lot of mistakes along the way, I would say. Uh, the key is recognize the mistakes, admit them, and, and move on, and, and don't make the same mistake the second time, right? And that's, that's kind of just how we live. And, and I guarantee you, in the next phase of Aptio's journey, uh, we're going to make a lot many mistakes. And, uh, and, uh, and, but that's, that's just part of kind of running a software business. Uh, so that's all kind of what I had. I think we have probably seven, eight minutes. Yeah. You know, that's a really good question. Uh, that's a discussion uh, 
I've had uh, quite uh, on a periodic basis with the board. And uh, so uh, we have, uh, uh, this is the discussion we have. Uh, I go through a 360, first of all, 360 review every, uh, every year from my team, from my board. And uh, so th that, that's an input factor. So we sit down with the board. And what I've always told the board is that uh, the success of Aptio is the most important thing rather than me being the CEO. And uh, maybe there is a time when uh, either A, I don't feel like I have the skills to take the company to the next level, or it could be the fact that, hey, I, I just don't want to do something different. Uh, so that's a dialogue which we have. Uh, at least the dialogue with the board has always looked like uh, as long as my team has been morphing, and as long as we are overcoming the next set of challenges, we're bringing the right talent, I get to keep my job. I, I certainly feel like I earn my job every quarter, right, from that perspective. Because the, the, the only decision the board can really make is to keep me or to uh, replace me. And, uh, but, but my mindset, uh, I'm very open with the board on this. I'm very open with my executive team that, uh, that the most important thing is making Aptio successful. And if I, if I Sunny uh, Gupta, comes in the way of that, then we should have a different CEO. Well, very challenging question and a great answer. What else? Sunny, can you talk a little bit about how you partner with your clients? Obviously, when you're taking on a big technology implementation, there's a lot of upfront work, uh, you know, kind of configuring it, and uh, ultimately, you want to get to that, the realization of the value. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about how the beginning, when you want to get the sale, how you execute against that, partner with the client, and a little bit about your, uh, your renewal success. Yeah, uh, really good question. So we are a subscription business model, which means customers buy us on an annual basis, and they renew on an annual basis. So what, what you learn very quickly in these cloud business models is that uh, renewals is the lifeblood of a company. If you can't keep a customer, uh, which means you're not delivering on the promise which you sold them on, uh, then uh, you, you're really going to have a bad business. So we've maintained pretty high renewal rates, but really what we do is, uh, this has probably been the big, big morph in the business. We used to go with a platform. It used to take us six to nine months to deliver early value to the customer, right? And it was highly customized implementations, longer sales cycles. Uh, I would say nine months plus was the early 20, 30, 40 deployments for Aptio. As we started uh, thinking about how to take the company to 100 million in revenue, a lot of our customers and prospects start to say, boy, I, I really want to do this, but I do not have patience for uh, nine-month deployments. Uh, I want to see faster time to value, and I want to see value in three months, four months, and I don't want to reinvent the wheel. I don't want to be the person who's going to uh, creating your thought leadership. So tell me what all your other customers are doing, and, uh, and you're the market leader. I will take that uh, and install that. So that's kind of what prompted us to move from a uh, platform cell to an application cell, where we were able to bring down that deployment time to three months or less. Uh, and, and, and that has also allowed us to start engaging with partners and uh, on our deployment services and start to create an early ecosystem. So we are, I would say we are two years into that kind of transformation. So average deployment used to take nine months, now it's three, three plus months. It's created early value realization for the customer, more happiness for the customer, and, uh, and better renewal rates kind of in the, in the long run, right? Um, so going back to the concept stage, you mentioned that one of the things um, you did was reach out to your potential customers. In fact, you said you, you also got so one big demo news from a few customers. Um, and then you, you leveraged your sort of past relationships to do that. Um, I was wondering how important is that um, uh, you know, aspect? And for some of us that are looking to, you know, or have an idea or start a company, um, if you don't really have those sort of, you know, relationships, how much time should you be spending on that? versus looking at you know, pursuing the idea itself? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. So uh, look, I would say uh, the, uh, you have to obviously spend time on your idea, your market, your those type of things. But in my opinion, it's a fairly simple answer because uh, 
you can't really, especially if you're in the enterprise technology space, uh, consumers is different because if you're building a technology company for the consumer space, I believe you have to get probably a couple of hundred different interviews. In enterprise technology, 10 to 20 tends to be kind of good enough. So, um, so you have to have, without the customer feedback, uh, your idea may be just the wrong one. And uh, so, so both elements are pretty important. And look, I've kind of been through that journey where there was a time in my life um, where I didn't have those relationships. And, uh, but in that time, I was just, you know, I was spending probably 25, 30% of my time networking or anybody who wanted to help me get to the customer. I, in fact, even, and I remember in my first startup, I ended up posting job postings uh, for the person I wanted to talk to just so I could, I could talk to five people, right? So it's, it's kind of really grassroots level kind of work. Uh, I think you live in an incredible time now, right, with what's happening with the, with, the, with the social media, with the internet, with, I mean, there are just LinkedIn, with just much more easier to get to, uh, get to people. Or, or I remember just offering $50 gift cards and those type of things just so we could get some kind of validation. But I would say, uh, I would say without the validation, uh, the validation is really important. And, and make sure your idea changes too. The idea has to change. In fact, if it doesn't change, that means you probably, either you're perfect, which, I, uh, which uh, rarely happens, or uh, you're not listening enough and not morphing enough. So maybe time for one more question, and I'll take it. So, uh, you know, you get, you get your aha moment after your meeting with Goldman Sachs and now a number of years have passed. Uh, what's happened to the competitive landscape? Are there companies out there that are, you know, trying to compete with you? And maybe in, in that regard, uh, you know, how important is it that you forge a relationship with some of the really super big companies like mm -hmm. SAP and Oracle? Yeah. So the competitive landscape has uh, changed a lot. Uh, uh, as I said, the technology industries tend to be very competitive. So when, uh, when companies, whether it's venture capitalists or whether it's large technology companies, see, uh, you know, see success in a new market, especially in a strategic category like where Aptio is playing, uh, that absolutely attracts competition. Uh, my personal perspective is, I didn't used to think this way, uh, Jim, probably eight, nine years ago, but I feel uh, competition is a really good thing. Uh, I wanted to be the lone wolf nine years ago, but today I believe for any category to kind of take rise, you need other competitors in the market to validate the market concept. So we've had, uh, we've had uh, two to three companies over the years who've tried to buy us or acquire us. And, uh, and we've educated them too much, and they have become competitors of Aptios. Large platform companies like uh, VMware has a small little capability in, in this space which competes, but our, we, our win rates are pretty high, 80% still. Uh, so the competitive landscape uh, comes in terms of the interaction with the big guys. We certainly integrate with all the big guys because our system needs to interoperate with them, but at the same time, we walk a fine line to not educate them too much around our core technology. Uh, so it's a, uh, I, I would say generally we operate in, in kind of the, um, in, a, in a co-opetition sense uh, because we worry about like, hey, a longer term competition could come from other, you know, other eight companies which are not competitors today. But we have to continue partnering with them today uh, but what I've learned is that partners uh, rarely, from a technology perspective, kind of help you uh, in the early days around market creation. In fact, we've had more success of partnering with uh, strategic uh, advisory firms like E&Y, uh, because though, uh, our agendas are very complementary. And uh, any time where we've tried to uh, partner successfully with technology companies, they're, 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 especially the large ones, they're always looking over our shoulder. So we, we have a very specific strategy in place. How do we work with the largest strategic technology advisors, but almost you want to be careful of how much you share. And uh, I, I, I know we, we personally, I can take uh, blame for this. I've personally created two competitors in my space. So. Wow. Thank you so much.